Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, Nancy McIntyre, the Associate Dean in the College of Business. For those of you I have not met, welcome. Um, on behalf of Dean Trumbull, who's out of town, and my colleagues in the College of Business and Economics, I welcome you here this afternoon for the fourth Samuel H. Weiss Executive in Residence Professorship Lecture. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our guest speaker, John Schiffsky. We practiced it too, John. Members of the College Committee of Advisors, Jim Dobbs of Northwestern Mutual, and I'm told there are many others from Northwestern Mutual here too, so welcome. I'd like to welcome Ray White, who is on our Board of Advisors, Michelle Wheatley, who is Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, and especially Dr. Sam Weiss and his wife, Ellen. <clears throat> the College of Business and Economics is honored to host this lecture series, which was established in 2005 to honor Dr. Weiss and to bring reality to the classroom from individuals having firsthand knowledge of the insurance and financial services industry. Dr. Weiss is a Morgantown native who received a bachelor's degree as well as an MBA from our college and then his PhD from Wharton. Dr. Weiss had a most distinguished career ranging from service as West Virginia's insurance commissioner to a number of academic positions culminating in his presidency of the American College. I'd like now to introduce our provost. Our, the provost of West Virginia University, Dr. Michelle Wheatley, is the chief academic officer responsible for, responsible for the administration of all academic policies, programs, facilities, and budgetary matters, except for programs in the health sciences. A major initiative of her first year here is leading the university-wide strategic planning along with President James Clemens and Health Sciences Center Chancellor Chris Galinda. Prior to joining WVU in January of 2010, Dr. Wheatley was the Dean of the College of Science and Mathematics and Professor of Biological Sciences at Wright State University. Her research has focused on, and I asked her this morning what this was, comparative physiology, most recently using a crustacean model to understand the logic of epith epithelial calcium transport. I'm told it's how cheese and, milk's get, cheese and milk gets in our bodies, in simplistic terms. She's been a principal investigator or the co-PI on approximately 21.5 million in NSF grants. She's had continual funding for 24 years from the NSF. She's written or contributed to over 100 refereed articles or book chapters, and she has taught biology, marine animal physiology, women in science, and human-computer interaction, to name a few. Dr. Michelle Wheatley. Good afternoon to all of you. On behalf of President Clements and myself, I am pleased to introduce Mr. John Schlifsky. This year, Samuel H. Weiss, Executive in Residence Lecturer. It is also a pleasure to welcome Dr. and Mrs. Weiss back to the campus. John was on his way to becoming an exceptional role model for students from the moment he graduated from the Kellogg Graduate School of Management at Northwestern University with a Master's in Finance and Accounting in, in 1983. John joined Northwestern Mutual in 1987 as an investment specialist and quickly moved up the ladder with increasing authority in the securities and real estate departments. In 1988, he earned the Chartered Financial Analyst designation. He served as Northwestern Mutual's Executive Vice President for Investment Products and Services from January 2004 to June 2008, where he was responsible for all aspects of the company's investment products, as well as the Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management Company. In June of 2008, he was named President and Chief Executive Officer of Russell Investment Company, a subsidiary of Northwestern Mutual, where he continued until March 2009, when he became the 17th President of Northwestern Mutual. From Shorewood High School to President of the 115th Company on the 2010 Fortune 500 list, 
John's experience ranges from managing company investments, leveraging buyouts, private equity and public convertibles, mortgaging loans and real estate, to annuities and mutual funds. Please join me in giving a mountaineer welcome to Mr. John Schlifsky. Well, I just before I get into my prepared remarks, I want to uh, thank you for having me here. This is, uh, as I told Jim uh, earlier today, uh, my first time to West Virginia, so that's been a fun thing. I've, now I've been to 45 states in the Union. I still have five to go to, but uh, uh, I was impressed by the beauty of the state. We, uh, I flew into Charlotte's, uh, Charleston, excuse me, but then we flew up to Morganville this afternoon at a very low altitude, and it's, you guys have a beautiful state, uh, so uh, very impressed with it. And I also wanted to uh, congratulate you on your basketball team this year. That was, that was quite an accomplishment, and uh, you know, I know you had a little bit of an um, injury thing at the end there, but it was fun to watch, uh, watch that team go all the way to the Final Four. What, what I wanted to talk about today is maybe something a little bit different than, maybe, uh, than what you would get in your typical finance and economics class. And it's, it's really, in my mind, about w how a good company, excuse me, how a great company continues to be a great company. And there's so many books out there right now about how, you know, how to go from good to great. There's the Jim Collins book, or how, to, you know, how do you elevate your performance and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I spent most of my career, I've been in the work world now for almost 28 years, and the f other than the last seven, six, I was in the investment world. So I grew up uh, as a bond analyst early in my career, and then when I came to Northwestern Mutual, I worked in the, what we call the private capital area, doing leverage buyouts and private mezzanine transactions, really a lot of fun kind of stuff. But what I was always looking at with, with companies that I, I, I sort of, it, it became not just a uh, profession, but it became sort of a hobby for me, which is trying to figure out how companies that are great remain great. And, uh, and a lot of that is not, has nothing to do with accounting or finance at all, and that's really what I want to talk about today. So if you look at all the books that are out there, there's an endless list, and Jim Collins just one of them, but there are an incredible list of books about turnarounds, good to great, and all that kind of stuff. But what, what's missing, I think, when you look at sort of the, you know, the business books at du jour is a book about sustaining greatness. Um, and to me, what that means at, is both excelling at what you do and maintaining that excellence uh, at a great level for a very long period of time. And that's really one of, uh, what I want to talk about today because ultimately what that means then, it's about driving long-term growth for a mature company. And so the title of my talk is Driving Long-Term long Enterprise Growth. And I really believe that there isn't a lot of talk about that. And it was especially true during the middle part of, the, of this past decade when everybody was trying to grow, grow, grow but nobody really talked about how they were going to maintain that. So what, what do I mean by this? Well, the first thing, I, what I don't mean about driving long-term growth is sort of double-digit increases in your share price over 15 or 20 years. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way, and public companies aspire to all of that. But if you just get out your calculator, the, the ability to compound anything at 20% or 15% over very long periods of time is almost impossible. I wrote down some numbers here. If you start at a 500 million enterprise value and you grow that at 20%, uh, excuse me, at 15% over 30 years, at the end of that period, you'd have an enterprise value of over, six, of over $33 billion. So that's, that's a huge company. There aren't that many of those in the country. But even more difficult, if you did get to that $33 billion, and then you continued to compound, let's say, at 10% for another 30 years, you'd be bumping up close to a trillion dollars in market capitalization. So this idea that companies can grow at double-digit rates of growth over long periods of time is not impossible, but it's nearly impossible. And it's almost, it's, I would argue it's almost impossible. And typically when you see that kind of growth, it's tied to a new technology or a new product or some new market that's been discovered, but generally it's not sustainable. And so what I want to talk about is growth that mature, large, profitable companies can aspire to and attain. And the reason I want to talk about that is because I think that's true about Northwestern Mutual, 
uh, where I work. Our, we've been in business for 153 years, and I hope when, you, when this talk's over, you can appreciate why I feel so strongly about, uh, about this kind of thing, because as the incoming CEO of a company the size of Northwestern Mutual, we have about $22 billion in revenue. Uh, we have about $160 billion of assets that we manage internally. You know, the, the idea that I would e either hold myself or would promise our board that I could grow at 10 or 12 or 14 percent over the remainder, remaining portion of my tenure, which is about 14 years, is, is just impossible. So I have to set a goal that's both achievable and maintains the standard of excellence that we uh, come to see at Northwestern Mutual. Now, the first thing that I would say is when I'm talking about long term, I'm not and I know you, you, there's a lot of young people here, and I'm just going to keep an eye on my watch so I don't lose track of time, is, you know, growth means different things, but when you're a 153-year-old company, we're defining the long term as multi-generational, so that's, you know, two or three generations of adults. I, I, I typically talk about it in terms of spanning scores of years, so we're not talking about decades here, but we're talking about 20, 40, 60 year periods, and it's a growth that has nothing to do with either fads or stock market cycles or economic booms, because it's, it goes beyond that kind of stuff. And so when I looked at companies to invest in, I was always trying to separate sort of the uh, vagaries of the stock market from what I call norm normalized enterprise value growth. And what I define that is, is it's not growth that's tied to a change in your share price, but it's growth that's tied to consistent earnings growth of the company, and whether or not it's retained is, is, uh, is not as important. And it's also not multiple expansion. Now, oftentimes, when you come out of bus periods like we have, you see company stock prices go up. The market's up, uh, you know, close to 100 percent since the lows of March of 2009. That's not the kind of growth I'm talking about, because that's more or less simply just a change in the multiples that are being assigned to the same level of earnings in any company. So when we talk about growth, we're not talking about multiple expansion. Not that I'm against it. It's a good thing if you're a publicly traded company, but it's ephemeral. Multiple expansion is oftentimes related to things that go beyond the control of management, like the interest rate environment. So um, w when we talk about growth, you get the point that I'm talking about uh, sort of long-term sustainable growth in a company's ability to earn money. Can you uh, grab that reserve side, Jim, so the projectors? Thank you. So let, I just want to show you what I, I'll give you an example. I'm not going to have a lot of slides today, but I do have a few. So this is Walmart. Now, I, I think Walmart's a cool company, but this is their enterprise value uh, since 1987. And what you can see here is that the enterprise value of, of Walmart today is about the same as it was back in 1996. So there's been no change in the market enterprise value over the long term. Now, we've had a couple peaks and a couple valleys in that period, but the fact of the matter is that the growth that you saw in the enterprise value of, of Walmart in the late 90s w was due to a growth in its market stock price, not in its earnings. Its earnings were growing during this period of time, but nothing like what you saw in this run-up in its stock price. And so basically, during the late 1990s, remember, people thought Walmart was a, was a growth stock. But then once it, that growth became uh, more normalized, the enterprise value went down, and it's really been unchanged over the last decade. Now, some of this is the market itself. You know, the S&P 500 uh, has barely had a positive return over the last 10 years. But it's what I'm trying to illustrate here is that when I'm talking about long-term enterprise value growth, I'm not talking about your stock price because that is not in the control of management in many cases. So the challenge then for a company is, simply put, is how do, how does a company that gets to a substantial market value or a, a substantial enterprise value maintain, and, and it's exhausted the growth that's gotten it there. So in Walmart's case, they basically build a store in every market they could, right? So the, a huge part of that growth was opening new locations. Once you get to the end of that growth period, once your store expansion has been more or less constrained by either geographic factors, cultural factors, or whatever, how do you keep this company growing at an acceptable and sustainable rate? So the first thing I want to do is 
define the, what I consider to be the, the, a long-term acceptable rate of growth for large mature companies. And, in, and this is my definition, you don't have to agree with it, but I would call it somewhere between two to five percentage points a year over the rate of inflation. And if a company can, so that's real growth, it's not tied to price increases. If a company can achieve real growth at two to five percent per year, every year, over long periods of time, it creates, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it creates an incredible amount of enterprise value. And in the course, case of Northwestern Mutual, that enterprise value is owned by our customers. Because we're a mutual company, we don't have shareholders, the growth in our enterprise value is basically owned by the policy owners of our life and other products. Now let's go back to Walmart a minute, because I think Walmart's a great company. Remember, this is their enterprise value, right? Let's show, if I'm pressing the right button here, and I gotta make it move, there we go. This is the growth in the value of Walmart in terms of the growth in their earnings plus, plus, uh, plus dividends, okay? So what you see here is a long and consistent pattern of growth. And this is what I'm talking about. So I'm not talking about the vagaries of the market, but I'm talking about the fact that Walmart, even as it matured through that growth cycle that ended in the mid to late 90s, was able to grow the company. And they're doing quite nicely now. And as you can see, they transitioned from being a high growth company tied to store openings to a sustainable enterprise value growth company through a number of other things. Now, most companies can't do this, and this is what I wanna talk about today. And what I'm, what I'm gonna talk about today is I'm gonna give you a, a bunch of reasons why I think Walmart is able to do this and why I think Northwestern Mutual is able to do this. But what most companies can't do is make that transition from being a growth company to a growing, mature company. And so what happens is they do dumb things. They make acquisitions that don't work out. They do stock buybacks and get over leveraged and get into credit problems. They, they sort of go through the financial engineering, which in the short run, might give you a little juice in your share price, but in the long run, it's not driving sustainable enterprise value. So here's what I want to talk about today is, what does it take to achieve this? So let's take some givens. The first thing is you have to have a business proposition that works. And uh, in my mind, there's three or four things that go into that. You have to have a business proposition that's unique, that's relevant, in other words, customers want it, and it's profitable. You've got to make money at it, and it's something you're good at. Those four things is what, when I was investing in companies, I always looked for. Unique, relevant, profitable, and you're good at it. It's very similar to what a lot of business school, uh, or excuse me, a lot of uh, business book authors talk about. But at the end of the day, it's really that simple. It's not that simple to figure it out, but once you have it, you know it. So when I talk about Northwestern Mutual, what makes us unique? Well, our focus on our risk products is unsurpassed by any company in our insurance business. What makes us relevant? Clients need financial security. At the end of the day, institutions, businesses have shifted the burden of financial security to individuals. You know, when my dad was uh, maturing as an adult, he could pretty much count on Social Security, his pension plan, and his home to provide for retirement. But those days are long gone. Individuals are responsible for their own for financial security and Northwestern Mutual provides it. So that's the uh, relevant part. We're a very profitable company and uh, we're very good at it. Our products clearly are the best in the industry and we always are shown to be that way by any independent third party expert. So you've got to have those four things. But then the question is once you have those, what, is that all you need to sustain long term growth? And I would argue that's not. I would argue that you need something beyond sort of the basic business fundamentals that drive profitability, and that's what I really want to talk about. So there's two things that go into driving long-term sustainable enterprise value, and most people will just tell you the first one. The first is what I told you, the profitable business model. The second, and this, it's not really a secret, but more and more companies, I think, have lost the focus on it over time. And what I'm gonna tell you about, you're probably at some level gonna think this is very self-evident, but I would encourage you as you look in, especially those of you getting CFAs or things like that, 
as you start analyzing companies, think about whether the companies that you're looking at buying or investing in or whatever follow what I'm about to talk about. Because it really requires three things. It, it, it requires discipline, confidence, and patience. And in this world where everybody's worried about next year's quarter, or excuse me, next quarter's earnings per share number, I think you see it less and less and less. So, hey, by the way, can I drink this? I, uh, I tend to talk a lot, so I uh, thank you very much. I'm going to take a brick, drink of water. So I see six things that any great company has to have to achieve, achieve this long-term enterprise value greatness that I want to talk about. And the first of them is something that nobody talked about two years ago and people are just starting to talk about now, and that's financial strength. Uh, you know, two years ago, I would, you know, go back to the summer of 2008 before Lehman blew up and everything. I would uh, bet a steak dinner that you could not find one article, and maybe, it, maybe you got to go a little bit further back to before Bear Stearns, but about how important financial strength was to long-term growth and enterprise value. Never, nobody talked about it. It was, in fact, in our industry, it was just the opposite. There was pressure on us from outside uh, parties to what, would, what was called lean out our reserves. In other words, take out every nickel of our, our balance sheet capitalization that we could, give it to our policy owners, and run on a very, very lean surplus between the difference between our assets and our reserves. And that's what we were being pressured to do. It was almost like financial strength was a bad thing instead of a really good thing. And of course, financial strength is really two things. It's a strong balance sheet, but more importantly, it's cash on hand. Um, when you look at all the failures we've seen, in the, and I, you know, I did private equity and not all my deals worked out, and invariably when I had a workout or a bankruptcy or something, it was because there wasn't cash to run the business. And so financial strength is something that people forget about in boom times but it's really important to us now. And when you look at Northwestern Mutual, of course, we're AAA rated with a stable outlook by all the four major rating agencies. It's a little bit self-serving to say this, but what I'm so proud of is that for us, financial strength is a permanent reality. We had a AAA rating you know, two years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. We have it now after the worst market correction since the Great Depression, you know, whatever you want to call it, the Great Recession. And for us, financial strength is something that we expect to have no matter what's going on in the economy. It's easy to talk about financial strength in boom times. It's incredibly difficult to have financial strength after the last two years in the economy. So why is it so important? Well, the obvious reason is it helps you weather the storm. No matter what's going on in the economy, if you're strong, you have the capability to maintain things. But the big thing that I think is interesting is look how many companies have changed their strategy in the last 12 to 24 months simply because they're not strong anymore, simply because what they thought worked when times were good don't work now that times are bad, and they're changing your strategy. And I would argue um, in any strategic planning course that's taught here that if you have a strategy that only works when the trees are growing to the sky and, you know, the birds are singing and all that stuff. It's not a good strategy. A strategy has to, tr to be a good strategy, it has to transcend markets cycles. But there's even more that goes around with financial strength. And, and there's two things, I think, at Northwestern Mutual that come out of this. The first is we don't have a fear of making poor decisions, okay? Nobody at our company is punished or fired or terminated because they make a single poor decision, because we're playing from a position of strength. It's like playing poker. If you have a lot of chips on your side and you're playing poker, you can play a totally different game than when you're down to your last two or three and you're just trying to stay in the game. And so it, it reduces your fear of making poor decisions, which is an incredibly important component in a company. Nobody is sitting around saying, I'm afraid to do something because if it doesn't work out, the company's going to blow up. So that's why financial strength is important. But the big issue why financial strength is important is it, because it leads to a zero tolerance around compliance, legal, and ethical issues. Um, if you are strong, it's not hard to terminate somebody who's doing the wrong thing. I was talking at lunch with a group of our Northwestern folks, and we just unfortunately had to fire one of our top 20 or 30 salespeople in the company. Now we have 7,000 reps, and so this guy's a huge producer, but 
the, re the reason I'm telling you this about, and I feel bad for the person, but the reason we're, we terminated him is because he not only willfully broke the rules, he then lied to cover them up. But we, as a strong company, can take a zero tolerance policy and we treat our best salespeople the same way we treat new recruits in the business. If you go over the line, you're out. Strong companies can do that, weak companies can't. So then it creates this brand around ethics and morals and compliance and legal uh, adherence to what you're trying to do. So financial strength has some obvious financial gains to it, but more importantly, it has an incredible aura around decision making and ethics and morals. Okay, financial strength is one. Second is culture. Now, good, strong companies have to have a positive culture. Um, you can't just have a culture, you have to have a positive culture. Now, a positive culture it can mean many different things to many different people, but it has to be one that people feel good about. Our culture at Northwestern Mutual, and this is the one I can speak to the most clearly, is basically do the right thing. In other words, we never want to compromise on doing what we know is the right thing to do. And in our business, with disability products, long-term care products, insurance products, our, we're in business to pay claims. But so many companies in our industry, because they're not strong, cut corners on paying claims, and they don't do the right things when it comes to honoring the basis of that contract. In fact, at Northwestern Mutual, we often honor things above and beyond the contract because we have a very positive culture tied to financial strength. So this do the right thing overshadows compensation plans, individual goals, corporate objectives. Never at Northwestern Mutual do we say we can't do X because it conflicts with our corporate objectives or we can't do X because it might affect our compensation or we can't do X because we'd have to go to the board and say we failed to do something. So you ha this culture is something that's very hard to build but once you build it you have to sustain it and I believe the only way you can sustain it is through financial strength. So we have all these stories about how we do the right thing and the, w the one that I was talking about most recently with, uh, with our reps, and I'll do it quickly, but we had a woman who bought an insurance policy from us. Now inside of our insurance policies is something called an additional purchase benefit, which means from time to time during the contract you can buy additional face amount of insurance without going through underwriting. It's a very simple, nice little benefit to have because it lets your insurance grow as your income grows. Now this woman was in the exercise period for this purchase benefit and she was killed unfortunately. And um, because of our rep who knew she was in this purchase uh, uh, period came to the Northwestern and said listen she was going to exercise this. Okay, There was no written communication, there was no verbal communication, he just knew in his heart that this woman was eventually going to exercise this. And on top of it we also had a program going on that allowed her to doubly exercise it and otherwise exercise two purchase benefits at the same time. And of course we did it. And my point here is not to pat ourselves on the back because we all feel proud of that, but it's to show you that the culture around doing the right thing takes precedence over the fact that when we pay claims our cash balances go down. Our, you know, it's, it's, it, we take a little bit of a financial hit. But if you always start with do the right thing, Eventually, it becomes part of your brand and it creates customer loyalty and I believe it ultimately drives enterprise value even higher. So it's not like you're trading off profits for doing the right thing, you're just trading off short-term profits for doing the right thing. And in the long run, I think it comes back. And then the added benefit is people feel good about working at Northwestern Mutual. Who wouldn't rather work at a company where you can go home at night and brag to your kids about something that the company did that went beyond what the contract required, that gave the policy owners more value than what they were asking for. And ultimately when customers recognize this, the shadow brand of do the right thing not only impacts your business, but it impacts the employee engagement that you have at the firm. So that's the second thing, positive culture. Now, different companies have different positive cultures. Walmart has one, you know, that's, that's really excellent. But, but I'm just telling you about what it is at ours. Then the third thing that comes up, which I think is really important, 
is, and this is really hard for a lot of companies to do, especially public companies. As a private mutual, we're, we have the luxury of doing this probably to a greater extent. But you have to forego short-term gains in favor of long-term gains. Now, that sounds simplistic, but most companies don't do it. And the reason they don't do it is because either they're too wedded to, they're not financially strong, they can't afford to do it, they, much, they need the short-term gain now more than they're willing to sort of defer gratitude and take the long-term, or they don't have a track record around long-term gain. Now, if I, if I started a company with our board of directors today and went to them and said, I'm going to make a lot of business investments and I want you to trust me that they're not going to pay off for five to ten years, they would say, are you kidding me? We've got to see some incremental progress during this period. But because we're 153 years old and we've demonstrated this long-term execution, our board and our management team is almost always willing to forego short-term gains for in the favor of long-term values. And in the insurance business, it's incredibly important to do that. The easiest thing to do in, in life insurance is misprice your product. It flies off the shelf. But unfortunately, in the long run, the value that is created gets eaten up by poor mortality experience or you know, worse than expected death claims and so on. And in a mutual company, the remaining policy owners get left holding the bag. And so from our perspective, when we underwrite business, we turn down a tremendous amount of business to Northwestern Mutual. You know, the joke is, if you get insured by Northwestern Mutual, you don't really need it because you're much healthier than the average population. But over time, what that does is it creates a much better product value for our clients. In fact, our mortality experience is so much lower than the industry average and so much lower than our closest competitive, uh, our closest competitor. We have an embedded uh, ability to outperform them year after year after year without almost doing anything else. It's a huge, it's a huge advantage. But the point is, you have to be willing to give up short-term sales in order to achieve that. Because in the insurance industry, there's always going to be a rogue competitor or a company that's desperate or a company that makes a mistake. It's not always a bad, it's not always a, uh, sort of a nefarious decision. Sometimes it's just a poor decision that misprices a product. And when that happens, it, the companies are trading short-term sales results for, the, for poor long-term performance. And the other reason it's important in the insurance industry is that this is a relationship business. Our reps have relationships that last with clients for 30 or 40 or 50 years. So if we're selling a product today just to get the sale, but over the long run that product fails to perform, that relationship's not going to be adhered to. So this idea of uh, trading off short term for long term is an incredible attribute for sustaining long-term growth, but you have to have the confidence, the culture, and the financial strength to do it. It even goes to compensation systems. So our, you know, a lot of the problems that happened on Wall Street in the last few years were tied to compensation systems that were incredibly short-term oriented. And our compensation systems are all tied to hitting multi-year targets. So not only do we create targets that are multi-year, but a substantial part of my compensation is uh, vested in, in fandom stock plans, if you want to call it that, that never have a termination point. There's always a rolling component to my compensation. So a huge portion of my pay until I retire is continually being revalued at new and better and better targets. Now, I'm okay with that because our culture, we tend to attract people that are more long-term oriented. But what it also does is it more perfectly aligns the management team, because so much of my pay is riding on this, with what the policy owners actually want at the end of the day. So our customers become stakeholders, and our employees become stakeholders, all in the same uh, venue. So it's this idea of long-term rewards and so on. Now, again, I want to say three things about long-term focus. One is you have to have an appreciation for it, and not everybody in our culture does. So you have to have a culture that attracts people that are willing to defer short-term gains for long-term benefits. By the nature of the fact that you're in school, you're doing that, right? But it's a continually evolving part of every person's psyche, and, it, and you need to have that. Second is you have to have confidence from your, from your stakeholders, your board and your policy owners. And then the third is, and this is a really interesting one, you have to have a tolerance for ambiguity. 
at the end of the day, the more long-term focused you are, the more unlikely you are during the interim period to really understand whether or not you're reaching that goal. One of our goals uh, five years out is a production number related to our ability to grow organically our field force, okay? And there's, that's not gonna be a linear path from today towards that goal. There's gonna be days when it's above it, there's gonna be days when it's below it, but you have to have a culture that can to tolerate the ambiguity day after day, year after year, of whether or not you're gonna meet that goal, but still have the perseverance to aspire to doing it. Okay, fourth point, two more to go. I think a huge part of any company that's able to sustain, sustain this kind of track record is what I call a sense of family with respect to the employees. Now this sounds really corny, okay, and I understand that. But the fact of the matter is, and you can use the word sense of community instead of sense of family, much like you feel on a university campus when your team's winning a football championship or a basketball championship, don't you feel that, that you're part of something much bigger than you as an individual? And I think you need that at a company. And what it means for Northwestern Mutual is that we tend to attract talent that's more interested in being on a winning team than it is in being a star player. And that's, 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 really, that's really actually a psychological uh, trait that you can find in very hard working and hard charging executives. And it's this ability, this, it's this notion that, I, and I personally subscribe to this, I get more psychic benefit out of the fact that Northwestern Mutual is doing well than I do in becoming the CEO. And I can promise you if I hadn't gotten this job and I was competing with five other people for it, um, I still would have stayed with the company because I'm, it's such a, the community that's Northwestern Mutual is such an important part of me. And the other five people that were competing for this job are all staying with the company in senior executive roles. So this idea that you're, that you're, you're you know, sort of the Maslow hierarchy and the, and the utils you get from uh, your job come more from the success of the organization than from the, uh, the uh, success that you have individually is a huge part of it. But to get there, you have to hire the right people, but you also have to have team incentives, shared responsibility, understanding what the team is. There's a great book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. I'd, if you ever want a, kind of a, a fun, easy read in the business world, I'd encourage you to read it. And it makes an excellent point, and I found this out when I went out to Russell Investments, one of our subsidiaries. I went there on a temporary basis to run the company while we looked for a new leader. And the first day we had a management meeting, and there were about eight people on the management committee that reported to me, and I asked them to talk about what they did. And they were so proud of using the word team. But the first guy said, well, my team does this. And the next person, my team does this. And then the woman who ran consulting, my team does So they boom, 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 oh, my team, my team. I go, okay, who's on my team? Okay, the problem was they were so focused on their individual teams within the company that none of them really were focused on how the company itself was doing. And you need that understanding of what the team is. The team is never about your business unit. The team is the company itself. And that requires a lot of rewards and recognition and celebration because if you get the satisfaction from working there from the, the company itself, you have to make sure that everybody feels it all the, all the uh, more. And you have to have transparency to the point of extreme vulnerability. And what do I mean by that? I mean that as an executive, you have to be willing to stand up and say, I failed to do something. I screwed up. I didn't do it right. And that's really hard in the professional world. It's almost impossible to find. But I, everybody says, what's the best thing about Ed Zor? He's my predecessor. And I always used to say, the thing about Ed is that he was incredibly hard on you about your performance, but then you got instant forgiveness. And so that's kind of the way I mean. In other words, if I screwed something up, I would go into his office and I'd, you know, get disciplined or criti criticized or constructively criticized or whatever the right terms are. But the minute I walked out, it was like a fresh slate. Now, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to lose your job. But there was never this sort of tying a can to my tail and saying, John screwed this up, we got to watch him. So not only do, do you get permission to fail, but you get the courage to admit when you're wrong. And, and that is really something I, I uh, hope people hold me accountable to. I'm looking at Jim because he's one of our field leaders. But 
I never want to get up and, and be in a position where people say, John is not being transparent with us. I think that's a huge part of this community. It's like any family. If you think your dad or your mom or your sister or your brother or your children are lying to you, that mistrust can destroy everything else that goes into a family. And I think the same thing's true at a business. My fifth point is really extension of the fourth, but this is a very overlooked thing in corporate America, I think, and that is you need to have homegrown talent run the business. All the other things I just said about a company are generally not sustainable if the executive leadership doesn't consistently and almost continuously grow from within. Because why? Because the, the sense of community is going to be different. The, the, the values around financial strength, be, the, cult, the positive culture is going to be different. So you constantly see this change. And I can assure you with Walmart, they have a very rigorous homegrown talent program, as we do at Northwestern Mutual. So I would argue that if you see companies that are bringing in new senior executives over and over and over again, there's something wrong with their business model at the end of the day. So, the first, so how, do you, how do you depend on homegrown talent? First is you have to use rigor in building your team. You know, I used to play college football, Division Three, nothing like this school. But we, I had a coach who always used to say there's, there's three kind of people on any successful team. There's the players you win because of. Those are your superstars. There's the players you win with. And even the best championship team has tons of players that are solid contributors, but they're not the superstars that make MVP year after year. But then there's always that third category that you want to get rid of, and it's the people you, you win despite. And those are the kind of people you have to constantly call out of an organization that really cares about its culture and really cares. So it's, it's, the, it's the incredibly great athlete that brings negative energy to, ever, to anything they do. Or it's the executive at a company like ours who just won't conform to what we want to do and wants to change it all the time. Now, I'm not saying change is bad, but when you start changing culture or values, that's when you got a person who you're going to win despite, and you really don't want them on the team. So you have to sacrifice talent for culture. At the end of the day, you have to be willing to say to a superstar, and you see this in the investment world all the time, you're out of here. You're not out of here because you can't pick stocks. You're out of here because you can't operate in the culture that we want. So Northwestern Mutual, I'll be the, I'm the 17th president. I'll be CEO on July 1st. I've been here 23 years. If I make it to 65, which is our mandatory retirement age, I'll have been with the company 37 years. Ed Zor, my predecessor, has been here 40 years. The guy before that was 36 years. The guy before that was 40 years. So we have this incredible legacy of growing hometown talent. But the, really, the important point is, and I mentioned it earlier, none of the people that competed for my job are leaving. And that's what makes me most proud. The board said to me when they said, you're president, John, what's the first thing you're going to do? I said, I'm going to call up Greg, Skip, Marcia, and Todd, and I'm going to say, I want you to be on the team going forward. You're more important to me than anything else. Now, some people don't have the courage to do that because, you know, there's sort of a Machiavellian quality to some CEOs. If I kill all my potential successors, then the board's stuck with me. But, I, but, I, but you know, I don't, nobody subscribes to that, right? It's a dumb way to operate. And so you have to have this notion where people gravitate towards being in a successful organization more than getting the top job. You can only have one CEO. If everybody in top management wants to be CEO, half of them are going to have to walk out at the end of the day because you can only pick one at any point in time. So it's this idea of rigorous performance but cooperative management, and that's really lost in this country. And people say, why, do, why isn't there good homegrown talent in most companies? And I think it's two things. I think it's uh, a lack of a rigorous succession planning process to start with. You have to have a leader that's secure, who's willing to give up power. Who, Ed Zor has, our outgoing CEO over the last 10 years, has given up an incredible amount of power to the next generation in terms of letting them run business units. Why is that? Because of two things. He's an incredibly secure individual, and he believes it's in the best interest of the company. That's very hard to find. And the second thing is you have to distribute ownership. You have to let people do run the business. So my, one of my mantras with my direct reports is I'm going to be incredibly diligent in working with you in terms of what I want you to accomplish. But I'm going to be incredibly hands-off in how you do that 
as long as you're operating within the ethical and legal guidelines of the company. In other words, I am not going to micromanage. And that's an overused word, but it gets into this how people do things. And the last and most important uh, thing that goes into sustaining this is what I call evolution, evol evolving around what you're good at, okay? So let's think about Walmart for an instance. What was Walmart really good at? I would argue three things. I'm talking about back in the 80s. They were really good at low cost. They were really good at logistics. And they were really good at opening stores in the right markets. That's what their strength was. They weren't a retailer, per se. They were a logistics company. And if you've ever talked to anyone who supplies to Walmart, you can understand why I say that, because the pressure to cut costs, in, uh, increase speed to market, and so on, is what Walmart's really all about. So how did they maintain this? Well, they evolved in a couple of big ways. They got into things like Sam's Club, which is really an extension of that whole thing on a much different scale. And they got into groceries and soft goods and food products, which is a extension of that thing. In other words, they didn't involve in upscale retail, or they didn't, you know, they didn't do things that they weren't good at because they were in the retail business. They did things they were good at because they were a, logist a low cost logistical company that was good at opening stores. So they evolved around what they're good at. Now, um, you know, I'll, I'll put out a proposition for you. And I hope I'm wrong, because it's a great American company. But if you, if you know anything about Kodak, um, what was their primary business up until about five or six years ago? Film. Who uses film anymore, right? Everything's on these little digits, or these little disc cards. So their, their business, I don't know the numbers, but went from billions of dollars in sales of film every year to now it's probably half of that, half of a billion dollars right now. I bet they have less than a billion dollars of film uh, sales in any given year. So what are they evolving into? They're evolving into technology around taking pi pictures and all the latest gizmos around cameras and digital movie cameras and so on. Now, I would argue that's a much more difficult evolution. It may be the right one for them because they're going from creating paper products that are sold in drugstores to tech gadgets that are sold in mass retailers like Best Buy or whatever your equivalent here is in West Virginia. So that is what I would argue is evolution around what they're not good at, or at least what they haven't been good at historically. So I, when you're looking at companies that are evolving, I, I would always argue, see if they're evolving around what they're good at. Now, for us at Northwestern Mutual, what are we really good at? We're really good at two or three things. We're really good at building long-term relationships with our clients through our field force. We're really good at managing a, what's called a career agency force in the insurance world. In other words, our reps work more or less exclusively for a general agent in a local market. And we're really good at managing risks within an individual customer's risk parameters. That's really what we're best at. Now, we, we make an incredible insurance product, too. But at the end of the day, those three things are important. So how are we evolving? We're not evolving into different markets like offshore markets or anything like that. We're evolving around providing financial security to clients. And the way we're evolving is around things that go beyond simple insurance products like investment products and so on. And ultimately what you see from our client base is that they are increasingly looking to our representatives to provide their complete financial security. And that includes mutual funds, stocks, bonds, wealth management, and all that kind of stuff. Now, whether or not we're going to be able to do it will be my challenge over the next 14 years. But what I'm very confident on why we're going to be able to do it is we're not evolving away from what we do best, which is sell risk products to clients that need it. Everybody needs life insurance, I would argue. Maybe there's 2% of the country that doesn't. Certainly anybody that's working needs disability insurance. And what you will increasingly hear over time is that people need long-term care insurance, too. So there's, a, there's almost a built-in need for these products in each and every one of us, and we provide that. So that's what this, e this evolution around what you're good at is about. And so let's just, I just want to put Northwestern Mutual up here, if I can get this to work. And does it look just like Walmart? Now, it's a different base, but you can see this constant growth in our enterprise value going back to 1980. Now, 
Of course, the scale is not a log scale, it's a regular scale. And if I took this back to 18, whenever we were created, eight, the 1850s, you'd see a continual upwards slope like this over 150 years. So I'm putting this up not to brag, but just to show you that I do believe what I was talking about today does contribute to sustained long-term economic growth. And the best thing about it for Northwestern Mutual is the people who buy our policies own this company because we're a mutual company. So they benefit from it, not just in terms of the risk protection they get, but in the value in their policies. Six points, build financial strength and keep it, maintain a positive culture, forego short-term gains in favor of long-term gains, sense of community, homegrown talent, and evolve around what you do best. You know, it is possible to build a great institution and then keep it great year after year after year. And uh, I'm really proud that I work at one of those. Thanks very much. I'd be happy to take questions right now. Anybody want to ask me anything? Or did I put you all to sleep? I would, I would say to you that everybody would be interested in, during this very difficult economic time, uh, why we stayed so strong. That's a great question. So that why did we stay so strong during the economic time? There's really two. Blew up. Right. There's two reasons why we were able to maintain our AAA rating even after the stock market um, slump. The first is on the asset side of our balance sheet. Um, we only take risks that we get paid for. So our, our asset mix at Northwestern Mutual is actually the riskiest of any of our peer companies. We own more equities than anyone else. We own more real estate than anyone else. We more, own more leverage buyouts than anyone else. We own more junk bonds than anyone else. But the point I always make is you get paid for those risks. Now sometimes when the market goes down 50%, it doesn't feel like it, but over the long run, we know that stocks will outperform bonds, high yield bonds will outperform high credit bonds, triple B corporate bonds will outperform government bonds because we have a rigorous underwriting proce uh, process and we only take risks we get paid for. What killed a lot of companies was that they were making bets on asset classes that they weren't getting paid for. The biggest example is subprime mortgages. Now subprime mortgages, if you bought them at issue, were priced th as a single A bond, you know, 110, 120 basis points over treasuries. And they were rated triple A, but nobody at our firm really believed that those were triple A securities. So that basically, naive investors were buying something rated triple A that really had the risk characteristics of a double B minus or single B plus bond. So the first thing is don't buy assets where the risks you don't get paid on. And that requires rigorous underwriting. It requires skilled, talented investment people. It requires, it, it requires people who are cynical when an investment banker or a trader calls you up to sell you something. Remember, when someone's trying to sell you something, there's someone who's actually selling it, right? So everyone, oh, it's a great buy. Well, why is someone selling that? You got to, what, what, you know, it seems sort of counterintuitive, but if someone's trying to get you to buy something, that means somebody doesn't like it, okay? Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing that killed a lot of insurance companies uh, is on the liability side of their balance sheet. They put in guarantees, particularly, particularly in their annuity products, that were not, that they couldn't fully risk, manage the risk on. So you know what tail risk is on a bell curve distribution? And many uh, annuity providers had guarantees and they couldn't, uh, through derivatives or hedging, eliminate the risk on the tails. And then, so when you get into a second or third or fourth standard deviation event like we had in, uh, you know, October through March of 08 to 09, those guarantees blew up in their face and it really crippled them. AIG failed. Now, AIG was an insurance company, but the insurance part of AIG is fine. What failed at AIG was the holding company that was doing all these derivative bets. Uh, and that was an example of taking a risk that they weren't getting paid for. So uh, I think that's, we, we don't have any of those liability issues at all. We have a very clean product mix and we stayed out of the asset problems by and large. But look, we lost three and a half billion dollars in the stock market. So it's not like we didn't lose money in the stock market, but you know what happened to those stocks after March of 08 or 09? They're almost back where they were. So the stock market has swings. You've got to be strong to own it, but over the long run, it gives you a better return than bonds do. What else? Yes. Uh-huh. 
I'll comment on it. Uh, and I'll comment as a observer, okay? I don't know anybody, well, I know people at Goldman, but I don't have a vested stake in it. I'm, I think, um, here's how I describe it. First of all, from purely a citizen's perspective, I thought what they did was horrible. Um, the fact of the matter, what was going on there was, uh, it's one thing, you have to understand, let me back up a minute, you have to understand that bank, bankers like Goldman Sachs are always on both sides of a transaction, okay? One thing you learn in the investment world is, though, when they're selling you something, they're also getting someone else to buy, to sell that, and they're, you know, they're swapping trades, they're always in the middle. So, so the notion that Goldman Sachs could be selling a CDO on one hand and helping a, another hedge fund short it on the other hand doesn't bother me at all, because that happens all the time in Wall Street, and you just have to, it's, it's sort of like the rules of engagement. What bothers me is that the creation of this pool, they knew was being driven by the person shorting it. And I think that's where they cross the line between sort of the rules, the caveat I'm tour part of the Wall Street, buyer beware, to doing something that I think is unethical and uh, I, I think uh, immoral. Now, is that illegal? The second part of my answer is I have no idea if it's illegal. There's a huge amount of poli uh, politi politics around that. Don't think for a minute that the reason that wasn't uh, announced last Friday is has something to do with the fact that financial reform is dead in the U.S. Senate right now, and they're trying to kickstart a political process. So, you know, there's all sorts of games going on in Wall Street, and that's one of them, but that doesn't excuse what they did. It just gets at the timing of when that announcement was. And, of course, you also saw that the SEC voted three to two to prosecute. Um, you know, that has some issues around the legal side. Look, we get, we're regulated by the SEC, and I will tell you that we make mistakes like this big, and they're errors of omission, okay? They're not on purpose. And we go through the ringer complying with the SEC, and we get fined every now and then because of a, really an innocent mistake, or, or basically it's, it's, you know, missing something. Here was a conscious decision to do that, and I just, you know, it just blows my mind that, that upstanding investors that make little mistakes get hammered, and here you have a company that was really out to screw a bunch of investors at the end of the day. It just bothers me as, as an American. And it, you know, it just makes Wall Street that much less tasteful. We need a marketplace for, for investments. Northwestern Mutual couldn't, couldn't survive as an investment firm if we didn't have a place to trade securities and so on. But it, it's just that greed on that, on that Wall Street the last few years is just despicable in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I think this financial reform legislation is is sort of part of it. Um, of course, there'll be fallout every time. You know, there's a whole school of thought that all the regulatory reform we have is really a response to the last economic crisis we had. You know, so we had the the, the tech bubble bursting in in 2000 to 2002. There was an incredible amount of financial reform that came out of it, mostly around mutual funds, how they traded A share, B share kind of stuff. Uh, it was all geared toward late trading and, and price fixing and things like that. So there's always reform that's going on. The problem with it, it's generally looking in the rearview mirror instead of anticipating the problems. I think the biggest, um, I think the biggest problem for this is that um, we need Wall Street, okay? Regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, a liberal or a conservative, this country needs an efficient, efficiently functioning financial market. And what I'm worried about is the retribution that comes because of this is so acute that it hurts the ability of the financial markets to function the way that we need them to. That's, that's what, but I can't tell you what that's going to be yet. I, I think the, sort of that paper's still being written right now. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. I hope it added some value to your very long day. Appreciate it very much.